So for those of you who've been following this series, you know very well that what we're moving towards is the crucifixion of Christ. Um, the, the, the whole point of this series is to answer the question, what was that sign about that they put above his head when it said that Jesus was the King of the Jews? And so everything so far has been the lead up, the story of Israel, and, and really just the story of, of that whole kingdom, and, and sort of how we get to even having a King of the Jews in the first place, as to what, what did that sign even mean? What was the implications of that? And so that's been the story so far. And last week, what we got to was the life of Jesus. And so what I did last week was give something of an overview of just some of the historical facts. These are the things that are pretty much indisputable. It's, it's, there are some who will say Jesus never existed. They're not serious historians. A a serious historian will say Jesus absolutely lived. um, And the basic things that we can glean about his life, again, are the things that we covered last week. And what is the most certain about the life of Jesus is that he was crucified. That is just simply undeniable. Uh, And so that's where we're moving this story towards. Um, But the question is why? What was it about Jesus? Why was he crucified? You know, what caused him to be hung up on a Roman cross. So that's where, again, this story is moving towards. And so what we saw last week was uh, not just the life of Jesus or some of the historical facts about Jesus, but we also looked at the political situation. Uh, Jesus was born in Galilee, but he was crucified in Judea, which were two different uh, jurisdictions. In the north, you had Galilee that was run or or led by a Jewish king, Herod Antipas, so the son of Herod the Great. And in the south, you had Judea, which was run by a Roman governor. Uh, They did have a Jewish king after the death of Herod the Great, but he didn't work out. And so what was put in his place was a a Roman governor. So the the most famous one, of course, that we meet is Pilate. Uh, And so we'll come to his story uh, in a few weeks. So the political situation is important for us to understand because that's so much of that is, is what uh, influences ultimately um, the, the location and, and really just the reasoning uh, for, for Jesus's crucifixion. But there was another uh, element to the life of Jesus or to the culture that we're dealing with. And that was the, uh, I guess what we might call the, the religious environment or the religious culture of, of the Jewish people. And this is a lot of what we've been covering so far in this series. So what I want to sort of sh- talk about today is a, something of a recap of ideas that I've already introduced throughout this series, but really as they pertain to the importance of of Jesus um, in, in his ministry, particularly Jesus as a teacher, but ideally um, Jesus as a, an opponent or, or a threat to the political structure and really the sort of the cultural structure of the Jewish people at the time. What, what were all the different factors that caused them to turn against him um, in the first place and then to ultimately to, to lead him to crucifixion? So we've looked at the political side. I want to look again at this religious side and, and really just get a, get a sense of um, who Jesus was, again, in his ministry as a teacher and so forth. So the key uh, element of what we're dealing with here, the, the key term that we need to sort of understand about the the ministry of the life of Jesus is this word Judaism. Now, it's a word you're probably familiar with. I've certainly talked about it a a number of times throughout this series. But really, it's an important thing for us to understand, to really understand who Jesus was and understand who the Jewish people were. Uh, How did a Jewish person understand themselves? Well, they would have understood themselves within the context of Judaism. Now, I used a moment ago the word religion. Um, I used that something of a descriptor because it's a word that we would be familiar with. But religion as we understand it really makes no sense to somebody in the first century. We think about religion, we think about it very much in a post-Reformation sort of Protestant idea where religion is something that is private. Religion is something that you have. And so I was, you might say um, about me that I have, my, that Christianity is my religion. Whereas for you, it might be, well, I, I guess Christianity, but it might be something else as well. You might say, I've got no religion. But the way the the only the the reason we can say it like that, or the reason we talk about religion that way, is because we have an understanding of religion that it is a private thing. It's something that you um you you do to your do for yourself. Um, you know, it's not something that the state certainly in a place like Australia, the state cannot impose on you a particular religion. At the same time, they can't tell you that you can't be of a particular 
religious bent. Um, you, your religion is something that you decide for yourself. It's something that you um, hold I, to some level of, of value uh, in your life. Um, but ultimately, again, it's something that is unique and private to yourself and and to whatever degree it informs your your morals and your ethics and your way of life again that's a personal thing so this idea of a personal religion again that's a, that's a modern idea that's something we can very much relate to and understand that's not something you can conceive of in the ancient world uh, the idea of the gods is something very different for somebody in Jesus time and certainly for the Jewish people so for the typical person in the ancient world, there are gods for everything. Gods are absolutely everywhere. There's gods behind absolutely every phenomenon that you see in the world. Gods are under every rock. There's gods absolutely everywhere in the world. And, and our job, our role or our, our, our purpose in life is just to stay out of their way, to not do anything that could offend the gods. What we do know about the gods, we don't know much about them, but what we do know is that they're very powerful and that they can control circumstances of our lives that can be, in many cases, life and death. And so the fact that the gods control those means that we need to keep those gods on side because if we don't, well, then the gods are going to turn against us. We, if we offend those gods, they're going to use whatever power they have against us in whatever form that takes. And so when bad things happen, the question that is always going to be asked is, which god have we offended? What have we done to offend that god? And most importantly, what do we need to do to get that god back on side? And so at this point, this is when temples and priests and sacrifices come in because you go to the temple of the god, you uh, encounter that god through the form of the god's statue, and you appeal to the priest and the priest will intercede with that God and say, okay, whoever you are, what is it that we've done? What do you require from us? Now, one of the ways that you can, uh, I guess, anticipate that or one of the ways that you can prevent that from happening in the first place is that you offer an annual sacrifice. So every year you would rock up to the temple and there would be an annual uh, festival for that God. And depending on the, the importance and the size of the God. So for example, if you're living in Athens, uh, Athena is the primary God. So you go up to the Parthenon and you worship Athena in, over a couple of weeks. It's a massive festival that you have. You have these Panathenaic games. You have these uh, incredible uh, festivities as a way of keeping Athena on side for the next year. It's really just buying an insurance policy for, for with Athena that she will take care of your interests over the next 12 months. So this is how the world understands the gods. This is how that we how, how we relate to them. And it's important for everybody to participate in that because failure to worship the gods properly for, and certainly failure to attend the festivals is a recipe for that God's anger and that God's wrath. And so if you are not seen at the festivals, if you're not participating as required in these festivities, then it's not just you that the God is going to come after, it's the whole city. And so you have a civic obligation to be part of these. Now, it's not that everyone, it's not that people didn't want to go to them. They were great fun. And very often that was great. There was free food there. It was the first time that year that meat would be, uh, you would be able to buy red meat. It, it would be a great opportunity just to come and socialize and, and, and have some time off work. All of it was a great time. And so there was a lot of incentive to come, uh, not just the fact that you're keeping the God on side, but the fun that you're going to have along the way. So people would turn out to these and that was no problem. This was always going to be something that every, everyone participated in, um, if only just to fulfill their civic duty, to make sure that they're not seen to be the ones that are bringing the wrath of the God on you. Now, the only people that would have an exception, an exemption from this were the Jewish people. And again, we've talked a bit about this previously, but the Jewish people would absolutely never in, in a pink fit turn up to one of these festivals. It's just absolutely not something they would ever do because, well, that's just straight up idolatry, right? There's, the very first law is against this very practice of going to these sorts of festivals. You shall have no gods before me. So no Jew in their right mind is ever going to go into one of those temples, let alone participate in one of those festivals. Now you might say, well, hang on a second, then wouldn't that bring about persecution on the Jewish people. The, the fact that they're not participating, isn't that going to be a problem for them? Now, um, no, not really, for the simple fact that 
they've never gone. <laughs> before the Romans were there, the Greeks were there, and before them there was the Persians, and all along through all of those centuries, Jewish people had been living in and amongst these cities. Ever since they'd been dispersed during the Babylonian exile, they would they were living in these cities and they were they were never attending the festivals and the gods didn't seem to care. So the Jewish people were never, were never turning up, and that was fine, and um, and everyone was okay with that. The only compromise that really came to was they would say to the Jewish people, hey, look, guys, you pray to your God for us, and we'll pray to our gods for us, and between all of our prayers, hopefully the gods will will treat us well. And so that was, an, that was a nice, easy payoff, but what it ultimately meant was that the Jewish people would never be seen at these festivals. So then for the Jewish people, religion, you know, quote-unquote, looked a lot different. For the Jewish people or for this idea of Judaism was something quite unique um, to certainly what the, 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 the typical Gentile people of that time would, uh, would understand. For them, the gods were something you only encountered when you needed them. There was no Church of Zeus. There was no you know, Bible studies to Athena. There was nothing like that. It was the gods are there and we stay out of their way, they stay out of our way, and we just do our very best not to offend them. But apart from that, there's no relationship to be had with these gods. They are their own beings doing their own thing. We do our thing and hopefully, again, we just don't step on their toes. So any relationship is really only so far as what have we done to offend them? What do we need to do to get them back on our side? But apart from that, you don't really think about the gods. Judaism is an entirely different thing. This idea that the Jewish people have of the relationship with their God is incredibly unique. And for us as, as Christians, if you've sort of, or even just our, our understanding, if you, whatever understanding you might have of the Christian faith, is probably a, a lot closer to um, to an understanding of, of what Judaism of what Judaism is. So the word itself, Judaism, it, it literally means to imitate the Jewish people or to imitate to imitate the Judeans. It is to be Jewish, to to do everything that is required or, or understood of, of what it is to be the Jewish people. And so the Jewish people are a, a, a group of people. They're, a, they're an ethnic group. Um, and so the requirement that comes along with being Jewish is what Judaism is. It's, it's, a, it's your entire identity. It's a cultural identity. It's an ethnic identity. It's a religious identity. It's everything uh, about your everyday life, every aspect of your life is permeated with this idea of, uh, of, of Judaism. It, it is what it is to be to be Jewish. And where that really stems from is, is an understanding of their God. Their God, the Jewish God, is a relational God. The, their God is the only God. Their God is the creator God. Their God is the redeemer God. Their God is the one who holds the world together. The world, He's the one who, who is the, the author of, of history, the author of creation, the author of our future. Everything about our existence is all caught up in this Yahweh, within, in this God. And so because he permeates all life and everything about our lives, then everything we do needs to be in accordance with that. It needs to be in alignment with, with, with who this God is and, and, and what he requires from us. Uh, I'll read you a quote here. It's from Paula Fredrickson. It's a great sort of summary then of what, of, of what we're sort of talking about here. So she says this, but this God who created was not a generic supreme being who stood in some vaguely causal relationship to everything else. The one God was specifically the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them was also concerned with the details of Israel's marital life, with the education of their children, with their just measures and fair law courts. Most specifically, he was the redeemer of Israel who re realized his promise to Abraham by bringing his people out of bondage in Egypt. The God of creation was, at the same moment, the God of Jewish history. So the, the basic or the core understanding of this God is that this is a God who rescues. This is a God who brought us out of, of slavery, who made us into a people, who's blessed us, who's called us to be his children. This is their understanding. It's far more, obviously way more relational than anything that would be understood by anybody in that time. And so it's a very unique, uh, it's a very unique way of of doing this relationship of, of doing what we might call religion. So that is it at its core. But what we've seen so far is that for the centuries leading up to our story is that we've got, is that there's been continual challenges 
that are facing the Jewish people. If this God had, had called them out and set them apart to be in relationship, called them into a covenant which had uh, a certain requirements for them to live by, what has been happening to them in the centuries to this point has been a number of challenges that have made that much more difficult. And so when we're going back right back to the Babylonian exile, the fact that they were taken out of their land in the first place. So to be the people of God, to be a nation who has Yahweh as their God, you need a land. You need to be in a place geographically that makes you a nation. You can't be a nation without that. And so to lose that was the first great challenge. In fact, this is the driving um the driving factor, even up until the time of Jesus, is the fact that the last time we got this wrong, we went into exile. And so we never want to have that happen again. We need to ensure that we never, ever go back to that place of exile. We never go back to Babylon. Uh, and so in order to m- make sure that never happens again, we need to live exactly according to what God wants from us. Because again, that's where we went wrong last time. And so after their return, they came back under Persian rule. And that was at the very least a restoration back to the land. But the dynamics had completely changed now. What has changed is that yes, they're back in the land, but it's not their land because the land is controlled by a Persian king. It's just a small part of his enormous empire is, is, is the land of Israel. And so, yes, we're back in the land that God gave us, but we're paying rent for it. We're paying taxes to somebody else for the privilege of living in what was actually given to us as an inheritance in the first place. So this is a problem. This is a massive issue. But more than that, after the exile, after the return from the exile, many of the Jews didn't come home. And so the very face of Judaism or the very um, d- the demographic of Ju- Judaism has completely changed because you've got a small remnant that has returned to the land, but many, many more of them have spread out through this Persian Empire into eventually the Greek and then the Roman Empire. And so what we find actually is that there's more Jews living outside of Jerusalem and, and Judea than there is living inside. And so what this creates then is a split of sorts between the types of people, the types of Jewish people you're going to find. And with each of the different groups, they're going to have their own unique challenges, the challenges that we're going to see uh, in a moment. So then in the next empire, in the in the Greek or the Hellenistic empire, these the, the challenges are sort of magnified culturally now in that what Alexander had spread, if you remember, was Greek culture. And this was very pervasive. Greek culture permeated every part of that empire, every part of your life. Uh, and this Greek culture was an immediate direct counter challenge to the Jewish way of life. It was the antithesis to everything that it was to be Jewish. And so this was what was permeating and challenging these, um, certainly the people in Judea, but even more the people in the diaspora who were a minority, who were living in now Greek-speaking, Greek cultural, culturally Greek cities. The challenge for them was to maintain their unique Jewishness, to maintain this unique identity in the face of direct cultural pressure. And that cultural pressure was coming through uh, through everyday life. It was coming through their education. It was coming through just their ability to engage with the world around them. In order to be able to do business with people in the city, you've got to have some understanding of how they think. They're not going to think the way you think as a Jew. You need to think like them in order to be able to engage with them. And so the pressure is to integrate to some degree, to you know, assimilate to some degree so as to be able to at least function in the community but at the same time not go so far as to lose your your Jewish identity which is actually what's meant to be at the core of your identity so Greek culture is a is a massively influential thing and that's continuing all the way through even into the New Testament time if only in the fact that well the New Testament is written in Greek and the reason for that is because Greek culture even conquered the Romans the Romans came in they conquered the Jewish people oh they conquered the Greek people but the Greek culture ultimately conquered the Roman people. After that, we had the the Hasmonean era. Uh, So we had a a brief century where you've got seemingly a Jewish king, but these Jewish kings were as Greek as the next people were themselves. And so they were really accelerating Jewish uh, Greek culture within Judea and within the surrounding areas. And so there was no, there was no king. Yes, it was a Jewish king, but not in the sense of a, a king who was an exemplar of Torah, which is what the king was always supposed to be. That was always the purpose of having a king in the first place. He was supposed to be somebody you could look to as an, as the primary example of what it looks like to be the people of God. Well, that's certainly not what these kings were. Uh, and so, yes, it's a Jewish king, but it's certainly not 
the sort of king that we're looking for. And so this frustration with the leadership ultimately causes splits amongst the people, certainly within Judea itself. And what we get as a result of that are these new groups. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes are all emerging during this time as an immediate counter to this pervasive Greek culture that's coming through their leadership and coming through the priestly class. Because if you remember, the king was also functioning as the priest. And so the very high priest of God was more Greek than he was Jewish. And so, well, we can't look to these guys anymore. We need to go and figure out a way to do it for ourselves. And then finally, when we come to the Roman era, when we come, uh, Judea comes under now Roman control, uh, and we've got a Jewish king again in the form of Herod, but he's only a client king of Rome. His job is to maintain the peace for Rome and to keep his job, and then also to collect the taxes. And so all along, all through the reign of both Herod the Great and then his sons afterwards, everything they are doing is on behalf of the Romans. They're a Roman king, they're a Roman puppet. And so they're never going to get the respect um, and it's certainly never going to be seen uh, as Jewish, let alone a Jewish king. They're they're never going to have that uh, because, again, we all know why they're here. We, We all know how they're keeping their job. And the only reason that they got their job is because the Romans are the ones that keep them in power. So all this to say, throughout the centuries leading up to Jesus, there are continual cultural challenges to being Jewish. Even living in the land itself has its challenges because we're still being constantly pressured and and influenced by outside forces and even from within. Even our own people, even our own leaders are corrupted by all of these cultural and, and pagan influences. And so what do we do? You know, we need to maintain our identity because we know what happens when we don't. We know that if we surrender to this, we go back into exile. We lose the land again and we go right back to square one and what we're waiting for is for God to redeem us that's what we're looking for we're waiting for God to come send a redeemer a king who's going to come along and restore things back to the way they were back to the way that God had originally promised to to Abraham and then to Moses that's what we're waiting for here and so we have to hold the line we have to maintain our purity so that God will bring about redemption rather than another rejection rather than another exile which again Again, we'll just simply put us back to square one and we have to start the whole story all over again. And so there's a real determination amongst certainly some of the people in order to, to keep this in the face of really the whole world against them. The Jewish people really are unique. Even to the, to the emperors themselves, they knew the Jewish people. They of, of all of the minority groups in the empire, the one that really stood out to everybody was the Jewish people because they were so unique. They just refused to conform. They just, in, in so many pockets of Jewish society, they just refused to toe the line. And so there was compromises constantly made to um, to for the Jewish people to remain unique in their identity. But there was always with that this constant tension that these people are just so different and they're so frustrating in their difference. So this idea then of Judaism is central to being Jewish and it begins with their racial identity. You are ethnically Jewish. You are descendants of Abraham. We remember we talk, Paul talks about this that you know when he's challenged by opponents in Corinth and they say and he says to them are they true, are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. I'm from the descendant from Benjamin himself. Right? I'm I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. And so ethnically this was incredibly important to be Jewish to be properly Jewish means to be um, means to be ethnically Jewish means to be from a descendant of Abraham but there were also other key characteristics that went along with that for example monotheism as opposed to everybody else on the planet the Jewish people are monotheistic this is what is so unique about them? They only have one God and this God does everything as opposed to the thousands upon thousands of gods that the Greeks and the Romans have. The Jews have one God and any, anything apart from that, they is not a God. It's, it's as simple as that. They're, 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 demon, they're demons, they're, they're false gods, they're idols. They're not the one true God. Uh, and so this idea of monotheism is, is absolutely central to the point where the assumption from an outsider looking at a Jewish person is that they are, well, 
that they're atheists. Uh, yes, you talk about having a God, but we can't see him because you don't have a statue for him. And there's a re- total refusal, of course, to have a statue of uh, of Yahweh because he can't be contained to an image. Uh, and so that idea, when if you, when uh, Pompey the, goes into the Jewish temple, when you know, Rome marches into Jerusalem, Pompey goes into the temple, goes into the Holy of Holies, which in and of itself was the highest form of blasphemy, goes in and he's stunned that there's no statue. This is shocking to him. And so the assumption has to be these people must be atheists because they don't have a God. Uh, The other unique or the other characteristic of the Jewish people, of course, is circumcision. We've talked a lot about this. And this is another defining characteristic of them. And it's very obvious who the Jewish people are when you go to the baths. Everybody's naked. Everyone knows who who the Jewish people are. But as a characteristic, as a practice, it was quite a, a disgusting practice, at least as far as the Greeks are concerned. They they completely abhorred the idea of of that sort of mutilation, as they would call it. Uh, and so this was something very um, offensive to to those around them. But for the Jews, of course, this was what another a unique identity marker that was given to them, given to Abraham, given to the very founder of them as as a people group. Uh, that they would also keep kosher, that they would not eat, well, pork primarily. Now, pork was the most readily available meat that uh, you could have, you know, beef and goats and, and, and lamb. That was only ever really available at times of festivals because those animals were very precious, very valuable, and they were kept for the elites and certainly for the gods. So you didn't really get much red meat, but pork was readily available. So pork was something that everybody would eat if you're eating meat. The Jews would absolutely refuse to eat that. And that was going all the way back to um, back to the time of Moses. And so that's all good and well for the Jewish people. What that meant for a lot of them was that in, in many cities, they just had to become vegetarian because there was just simply no meat available. And there was even the, 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 the red meat that was sacrificed was always to a god. And so you couldn't eat that because it was it was idle meat. So we, we basically either just eat fish and vegetables and that's really what our diet is going to consist of. But the fact that they didn't eat pork was seen as something of um, their, their their perceived superiority, that they were trying to be... The assumption was that they were trying to be seen to be socially superior to everybody else in that they don't eat this these disgusting animals. They, they think that they're better than everybody else. And so it's another point of scorn. It's another reason, another way in which the Jews stand out is that they don't, they don't eat pork. And uh, it's, in fact, it's quite funny when um, Caligula, the emperor Caligula, is go, goes to down to Alexandria and he's in sort of a having a bit of a conference or he's having a conversation with uh, Philo and a couple of the other a couple of other Jewish delegates and you know he's not really taking them very seriously and at one point he turns to them he says just sort of jokingly so why is it that you don't eat pork you know very very sorry mocking very scoffing at, at the Jewish people that they that they don't eat pork and then finally that they keep Sabbath every Saturday you don't see the Jews around. They're, they're going to be at the synagogue and then they're going to go home because they don't work on Saturday. Now, and this is a world where every there is no such thing as a weekend. Everybody works every day of the week. And so, again, it's another point of scorn. It's another point of ridicule for an outsider because they just see it as, well, you're just having a lazy day, right? You guys are just lazy because you're not working uh, one day a week uh, or you're, you're only working six days a week. And so this is, again, another point of distinction, but, but also another point of scorn. But again, sort of coming back to our key point, we're talking about Jesus been the king of the Jews and ask you know, who, who the Jewish people are. Well, again, it, it comes, it's, it's characterized by this idea of Judaism. But when we think about, or to, to understand Judaism, we can't think about it as being some a sort of monolithic idea, some sort of homogenistic idea where everybody, everywhere, Jewish people all over the world are exactly the same people. Uh, because they're just simply not. You know, I've already talked about the the diaspora, and so there's Jewish people who are living on, in every part of the Roman Empire, from Ro- Rome itself um, all the way back down to um, to Jerusalem and, and everywhere in between. There are Jewish communities set up absolutely everywhere, and so amongst this diaspora, these they would have sort of absorbed a lot of cultural flavor. You know, I kind of use the example of wine. I might have used this before, but if you think about, uh, you know, a Shiraz grape, for example. So in Australia, we have Shiraz grapes, and as far as I'm concerned, they're very nice. When you go overseas, you can also buy Shiraz wine, but it, it has a different flavor about it. It's it's the same grape. It's the same seed. It's a Shiraz grape, but 
it's also a product of its environment. It's a product of the water and the soil that it grows in. So it takes on cultural flavors. And so Judaism within the diaspora is going to have its own particular cultural flavors depending on where you find it, in, in the same way that Christianity does. Christianity is not just some, you know, homogenistic sort of idea that Christians are the same absolutely everywhere. Christianity all over the world is going to look different and it's going to take on cultural flavors that are, you know, relevant to the society that, it, that it's growing up in. And so this is a perfectly normal phenomenon that we're going to find. Ju- Judaism was no different. But there there were also things uh, that were common amongst the, the diaspora Jews. Um, primary amongst these was Sabbath, circumcision, kosher. These were absolutely standard markers for being the Jewish people. And, and it's in, in the same way, you know, if you go to, if you think about Christianity, you can go to churches around the world and they're going to look different. They're going to have a different flavor about them, but they're also going to have very common th- things in common. They're, they're going to meet on Sunday. They're going to have a church service. That church service is probably going to have some songs. It's going to have a sermon. It's going to have a communion. Um, there are going to be things about Christianity that are absolutely immutable. These are things that do not change wherever you find it. But in other in other ways, it is going to be different. It's going to be flavored according to its different culture. And again, Judaism is no different. And so the standard features of Sabbath circumcision kosher this is what it means to be jewish and that and that will never change in the same way they celebrated the festivals again wherever you go in the world as christians you're going to celebrate easter you're going to celebrate christmas you're going to celebrate probably passover these are things that you're going to sorry um, pentecost you're going to celebrate these occasions as christians that's going again these are the standard identity markers so although you're going to have different flavors of judaism you're also going to have these same um, characteristics and amongst those being the festivals. Now, the festivals themselves, they serve the same purpose as Easter and Christmas would for us. They serve to commemorate important stories or important events that happen within the life of them as a people. And so primary amongst these, of course, is the Passover. Passover is the, it's like Christmas is to us or Easter is to us. Um, the Passover is, of course, when God brought the people out of Egypt. It's when God took them out of slavery. And so this Passover festival is going to be celebrated absolutely everywhere at the same time. This is a primary thing. And it's going to be important for our story because, of course, it's during the Passover that, that Jesus is crucified. It's So during this time of celebrating when God liberated his people, it's symbolically important then that Jesus is crucified at the Passover because if you understand what's going on, you realize that God's doing the same thing again through this crucifixion. And so wherever you find yourself in Jewish communities, you're always going to find them celebrating these festivals all over the world and, and, and still true today, right? You're going to still, it's still, still going to celebrate Passover, still going to celebrate Hanukkah within these different cultural um, climates. Uh, Hanukkah being, of course, the celebration of the, the of Judas Maccabeus and, and the, uh, the sort of the overthrow of the Greek tyrants that had been ruling over them. And so the festival of lights that Jesus refers to in the gospel of John, this is a celebration of that event when they come into the temple and they need to cleanse it. They need to restore the temple because it had been defiled by the Greeks. And so in order to do that, you've got to burn oil. You've got to burn uh, the menorah candle. And what happened was, is they didn't have enough oil to to do that. They didn't, there wasn't enough oil for the eight, for the days that are required for the, for this um, purification to take place. But by a miracle, the oil lasted the little bit that they had. It lasted for the period of, of the purification. And so every year on Hanukkah, around about the time of Christmas, is when this, uh, this same event is going to be celebrated. But again, always remembering important markers of what it means to be them as a people and especially what God has done for them. It's a continual reminder that the God who acted for us back then is the same God today who can still do the same thing for us in our current situation. And for these diaspora Jews as well, they still are connected back to Jerusalem. Uh, they still pay a temple tax, so a half shekel tax, uh, pay it annually. Everyone is expected to pay that. And so that goes directly for the support of, of the temple, for the priesthood, that's going on down there. And for many Jewish people, if they have the means to do it, they make a, a pilgrimage back to Jerusalem in order to uh, to celebrate, in order to particularly to celebrate the Passover. And so this is, again, when we come back, come into the story of Jesus later on, this is why 
the place is so crowded. This is, in fact, why there's so much more um, heightened Roman patrols in the region, because this is when all the pilgrims are coming to Jerusalem to celebrate. And so there's many, many more people in the city because this is what they do. We, we see this through Jesus' childhood. When he's 12, they, they make their pilgrimage down to Jerusalem. You know, Mary and Joseph leave him behind and they don't realize that they've left their kid behind. It's all very awkward. But it's a standard pilgrimage that the Jewish people are going to make back to the holy city, back to, to the temple for these festivals. Now, what was at the center of the Jewish idea or the, what was at the center of Judaism was the temple? The temple is the most important feature of the faith. Every god has their own temple, but the same god can have temples set up all over the world. They're not exclusive. What The way that it would work would be that you would, you know, just say you're talking about Apollo, for example. Well, you can go and visit temples of Apollo all over the Greek and Roman world. So he's absolutely everywhere. And it was always the same Apollo. It's the same god. But what he would do is that he would just go and, go and visit his different temples at different times. And so when you have a festival in a particular area for him, that's when he, he might come and visit the temple and, you know, turn up, represent. Um, but that's the only time he, he would ever, ever sort of be there. But the temple in Jerusalem is different in that there is only one God and he is... He consumes the universe. He doesn't actually need a temple to house him because he's absolutely everywhere. That's the whole point of this one monotheistic God is that he is everywhere in all places. He is the creator and that holds the universe together. But if you, when you want to encounter him, when you want to come into the Holy of Holies and directly encounter him for the purposes of sacrifices and for the purposes of making atonement for the sins of the people, you do that at the temple. And so that's where you come to to do those activities. Again, this is the God who is absolutely everywhere, but for that moment of encounter that has to happen at the temple. And so this is why you make the pilgrimage down to Jerusalem at, at different times of your life, and particularly for the festivals. You come down because the temple, it it represents the place of God on earth. It's something like if this was a theocracy, that's Parliament House. That's where you come to do the work of the ministry of God. And that's where the sort of the, the priesthood the priesthood flows out from. That's where, again, all of this sort of the 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 sort of the spiritual work, I guess, of Judaism is being done down in the temple. But for the majority of Jewish people, as we've said, they don't live in Jerusalem and they don't even live in Judea. Um, you know, the people living in Galilee are somewhat closer, but even they have to make a pilgrimage down to the temple. It's not like you can just sort of walk down the street every day and walk past the temple. Only a very few people have the privilege of actually being near enough to the temple to have it in their lives every day. For the majority of people, it's, it's a long way away, in some cases on the other side of the empire. So what do you do in those cases? How, how do you maintain your Jewishness apart from the temple? Well, again, you pay the taxes, you pay, you pay the, the half shekel tax every year for its upkeep. But for you in your everyday life, what you have is Torah. This is the most important feature of Judaism is the law. It's, it's your, well, what we would call a Bible. In fact, really, this is what was most unique about Judaism as opposed to every other form of God and cult that you find in the ancient world is that they had a book. This is really one of, in fact, one of the appealing things about what, about the Jewish people and about Judaism is that their God actually wrote stuff down. The problem with the gods of the Greeks and the Romans is that we don't know what they want. They change their minds every day and nothing is written down about them. This is why you need priests. The priests are the ones who intercede for us and they, they go and they make requests of the gods and they ask for signs from the gods and interpret, you know, what are the birds doing today? What are the intestines of this animal that we've just cut out? What are they telling us? We just don't know what they want. Whereas this God wrote it down and he actually wrote a whole book and, and a series of books that talk about not just what he wants from us, but who he is. He reveals himself through these scriptures. He, 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 he tells us about history. He tells us about who we are, what we are, where we are, why we're here, what, what the problem with us is. It, it, it answers the, existen the existential questions to what it means to be a human being and most importantly gives us the solution to that it shows us what we need to do in order to bring about restoration to to make the problem right so torah is so absolutely essential and so um valued and, and really so attractive to many of those around because it for for, for many it it 
it kind of resembles a lot of their own philosophical ideas that that they themselves had. We'll come back to this probably next week or the week after. The 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 sort of the philosophical appeal that Torah brings with it as well. But what Torah ultimately is is that it's a mobile temple. What we would go to the temple, and and in fact, what any person, any Greek or Roman person in that time, they would go to the temple to find out what their God wants. For the Jewish people, they carry that with them. They have scripture with them all the time. They have it in their synagogues. They have it in their homes. They have it memorized. They have it in their minds and in their hearts. So they carry with them always the, the presence of their God, the, the requirements of their God. They, they have their God with them always. They have the temple and everything it represents is, is transported with them everywhere they go. And so it's absolutely essential. This is at the very heart, the, the very beating heart of, of Judaism itself. All of the external symbols, the circumcision, kosher, Sabbath, all of those are important markers and they set you apart from other people. But what is at the core of Judaism, again, is scripture, it's, it's Torah. So with that then, one of the most important uh, requirements of Judaism is to uphold and protect scripture. That's what, it, that's what our job is. Uh, God has revealed, him to, has revealed himself to us in these texts. We take these texts, this temple with us. And so in the same way we protect our temple and in the same way that all cults and all people would protect their own temples, we protect our temple, but we also protect Torah. Not just in that we protect the texts themselves, but we protect its requirements, the, the virtues that we find within Torah being, so, being the central part of of what it means to be Jewish, we need to protect that by living them out, by doing the things that this text requires from us. And so Torah or, or living out Torah is the way that we protect it, is the way that we carry it on. It's not just something that we read and admire, but it's something that has to transform us and infuse us and change the way and cause us to live in a certain way. So we protect it by doing that. And again, this is where it becomes a real problem later on for Jesus, because he's confronting the very people who are who are the the protectors of tradition, the protectors of Torah, and what it means to the people of God. At least that's how they perceive themselves and how the people perceive them. By challenging that, Jesus is more than just challenging their ideas, but he's challenging seemingly the very nature of being the people of God itself. This is a direct attack on Judaism, and so this is not something we take lightly. And for the Jewish people, again, this is what we need to be protecting in our everyday lives. And so again, I know we've talked about this before, but this is where the synagogue becomes so essential. The synagogue is such an important feature of the people of God, of what it means to be Jewish, and particularly in the diaspora. The diaspora is, uh, you know, you are the minority. You're surrounded by hundreds, if not thousands of gods and a multitude of ethnicities and beliefs and philosophical ideas and cultural pressures. You have to maintain, to be Jewish means to live every aspect of your life down to your very breath has to be infused with this this Yahweh and so you have to create a community around that you have to put something of a, uh, a, a some boundaries or some protections around you and the way you do that is through community you surround yourself by other people who are exactly like you you can't it's it's hard enough when you're in a small group it's, it's impossible when you're by yourself so in order to do that you need a local community, and for that community to have an identity marker, something that they can uh, they can sort of um, resonate with, or something that they can be sort of um, consumed by, is you, you need a building, you need a place to go, and so that's what the synagogue comes to function as. The synagogue really is the community center for the Jewish. Uh, for, for the for the Jewish population or, or, of any place. And there might be multiple synagogues in a city. And so within each of these synagogues, you're going to have, that's where you come in on Sabbath to to hear Torah being read. It's where you come in to pray. It's where you come in to, uh, you know, you, you imagine weddings are happening there and court cases amongst the Jewish people. School is happening there for the kids. Festivals are happening there, feasts, uh, all of this. Everything that it means to be Jewish, is t- it needs a place for that to happen. In the same way for us to be a church, you need a place to go. You need a building to go to to be a church. You need, a, or at the very least, a house to go to, some sort of shared space in order for that to happen. And so this is what the synagogue functions as. So then Judaism, it's, it's unique. It's not like any of the Greek or Roman cults that 
you 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 would be familiar with or that were familiar to everybody else amongst the people of the ancient world and it's not like religion of that we might understand today it's not like a a private thing that oh well you know i i'm a part of the Juda- judaism religion and you know that's my own personal thing that's not how it's understood either it's 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 a community it's yes it's individuals who adhere to judaism who who judaism is them but it's expressed in community it doesn't work apart from community and the same can be said of christianity we think we try to categorize christianity as a religion and say that you are a christian you know as a private thing but to be a christian you cannot do it apart from community you just simply can't you people that say that i'm a christian but i don't go to church and i don't have any christian friends are not really Christian in that sense, at least not in the fullest sense, because to be Christian means you have to be part of a body. You have to be part of a group who share that same identity and who participate in relationship with one another, but also with the the God who brings together that community. And so Judaism is the same in that sense that it's a community, it's it's, it's an ethnicity, it's everything about every aspect of, of your life. And so it's spread then through the synagogue it's spread through houses it's it's done at home with the family you you you're part of a family that's jewish that the family itself is the expression of judaism it's not that a member of the family happens to adhere to judaism you are part of a family that is judaism and so because you have that Judaism that binds your family, that family becomes the expression of that. And so for parents, as an expression of their Judaism, raise their children according to Torah. It's not just that, oh, you know, we go to Sabbath, we we go to the synagogue on Sabbath and then that's all our Judaism really counts for. No, it's everything about your parenting is is informed by Judaism. It is that you raise your kids as the people of God, your obligation as a father and a mother, uh, you you maintain the faith, you maintain your your Judaism by the way that you parent, and then by the way that you engage with other Jewish people within the community, the way that you engage with them at synagogue. So the the very locations, the family of the the location of the synagogue, it's not just a place to come together to meet, but it's a it's a place to come to express and to reinforce and to spread Judaism as well within the community. So it's an entire holistic thing it's 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 much more than just a religion it's certainly much more than the cults of the of the time that it sort of emerges in it is it, it it's an it's an all infusing all encompassing uh worldview that is part of every every aspect of your life and well in many ways it's very impressive in, in many ways it's very attractive. Um, what we find happening quite a bit actually in the ancient world is that many what we would call Gentiles or certainly what the Jewish people would call Gentiles become Jews. They convert to Judaism. They go through the process, even through the process of circumcision in order to become adherents to Judaism because this thing is so impressive, because this thing is so, um, it's it's holistic, because it's so clear it's it's complex yes but it's also very simple and clear in that well there's only one god to begin with we don't have thousands and thousands of gods it's just one and this god takes care of everything we don't need to know and try to keep happy all of these gods who don't care for us at all here's a god who does care for us here's a god who makes it very clear what he wants from us and gives us a very clear set of instructions for for how to live in a way that pleases him but also builds community and the community itself was a strong community the community itself was in so many ways, very attractive and very appealing. They, their ideas, they, they don't just talk about, you know, how to keep a God happy, but they talk about how to be happy, how to live a happy and fulfilled life. They talk about every aspect of what it means to be a flourishing human being, which was a key question of amongst the philosophers. Again, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. And so there was a lot of appeal, even beyond, you know, even that the, the surpassed, having to be circumcised as an adult, there was still so much appealing about this that, again, many uh, Gentiles converted to Judaism and they became God-fearers. They, they became, you know, these, these adherents to the Jewish way of life. Now, that presents a challenge for those people because in order to become an adherent to 
this Jewish God means to forfeit all of the previous gods that you've worshipped. That is the it, that's the main challenge that they have to face, and the and the blowback and the persecution that comes as a result. And this is in fact what. Uh, becomes the primary catalyst for persecution against the Christians later on. I've talked about that in previous episodes and maybe talk about it again at a later stage. But it's the fact that you have to leave behind these gods. But even knowing that, even knowing what's going to come your way when you do forfeit those gods, there was still enough of an appeal within the Jewish community to still go and become part of that. And so that was something that happened, again, quite quite regularly. Uh, it was a very appealing thing for for these people. And then finally, and that's the last aspect that we, we, we have of Judaism. And again, I've talked about it being um, very sort of, in so many ways, they, they share in common core uh, core ideas, core core values, core practices, but at the same time, there's a lot of diversity uh, amongst Judaism. Uh, so we've seen the different groups that have emerged: Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, in particular, are some. They're, they're different expressions. They they would all claim to be uh, part of Judaism, but they have very different ideas of what Judaism requires and they have different interpretations in that sense of what Torah requires to be the people of God. Remembering to be the people of God means to live uh, your entire life in a way that pleases Yahweh. And so then the question is, what is it that Yahweh wants? How, what is it pleasing to him? And you say, well, he reveals that in scripture. Yes, he does. But at the same time, there's things in his scripture that need to be unpacked for that different context. The world has changed a lot since the time of Moses. And when we're in the desert, when that law was given to us. And so what does that mean for a time when we're living amongst the Greeks or the Romans? These are the questions, the everyday questions that you have to ask as a part of this. And so because of the different ideas and different uh, assumptions about what that means, what we see emerging are different expressions then of Judaism in the same way that we have different denominations amongst churches. They're, They're all Christian, get mostly, um, and they would certainly claim to be Christian, but what they're, what differentiates them is a different, uh, I guess, understanding or a different belief about what it means to be Christian. What is it Jesus wants from us? And that's going to just be, if that's uh, answered differently, it's going to create different ways of doing Christianity, different de- denominations. So we have these different groups then that have emerged, and amongst these different forms of Judaism, the one that's going to come later on in our story is this one that we call Christianity. Christianity or the followers of the way, the followers of Jesus, they, they didn't see themselves as starting a whole new religion. They, they, they had no concept of starting a brand new way of religious idea for the planet. They just saw themselves as the logical extension of Judaism. Jesus himself was working in the context of Judaism. He was a teacher and a, not a participant, but also a teacher of Judaism. He had a diff- he had a particular idea of what Judaism is and and what it requires of its people. And so that's what he taught. That's what brought him into conflict with competing teachers, which we're going to look at next week, but different just competing teachers of what it means to be the people of God. And so he wasn't starting anything new. He was coming along and saying, this is what scripture has meant all along. This is what God has required from us all along. This is the true Judaism. And so the followers then of Jesus, particularly Paul, they weren't creating a new religion. They were just saying, well, this is what Jesus has started as the true expression of Judaism. And so what we are is the fruit of that. We are the logical outworking of what God has always been doing through the people of God, through Judaism, and now into what we call Christianity. But it has at its roots this idea, this Judaistic idea of God is the maker of all things, the creator and sustainer of all things. He has a plan for humanity, not just for the Jewish people, but for all of humanity, a plan of salvation. And that plan has been reached in or has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so what we are doing now is living out the natural, logical outworking of what it is that he set in place. So that was a long and sort of somewhat repetitive in that it repeats a lot of some ideas that I've talked about before, but it 
it's important for us to sort of get that sense of, of of the I guess religious culture of the time to really understand how what Jesus was, who he was, how he understood understood himself, and most importantly, what his ministry was about. What was it? Jesus wasn't just born and then crucified. He did a lot of things along the way that made a lot of people angry. And the thing that made people angry was the way in which he taught, was the ideas that he taught, and the way that he challenged the prevailing authorities who saw themselves as the I guess I want to say embodiment of Judaism and what it means to the pe- be the people of God. He directly challenges those guys. And so then as a result of that, he's crucified. But again, understanding that it's it's only within that context of Judaism that everything that Jesus does from here can make sense. And so what we're going to look at in the coming weeks is what that ministry was and, and what were the elements about it that ultimately brought about the crucifixion that we're going to get to at the end. Well, anyway, I hope you had a great week. I look forward to seeing all of you next week as we continue our series. Uh, Until then, have a great week. See you then.